Welcome to our um, mass spectrometry training series. Um, I'm delighted this afternoon to uh, um, welcome uh, James McCulloch. Um, I'll just give you a very brief introduction to, to James. Um, so James started his, um, did his, his first degree at uh, Durham University in 1999 in natural sciences. And uh, then he did a master's degree in medical anthropology at UCL. He then moved to uh, Waters, the mass spec uh, uh, company where he's working, as he just recently told us on, on, on QTOF development. Um, and then he moved to Oxford and did a DPhil here in 2006. He has um, decided to stay at Oxford uh, since then, and he's been very successful. He's now a uh, professor of biological chemistry um, in the, in the uh, chemistry department here in, in Oxford. And um, I'm delighted that he's here to speak to us today. And um, I'll pass you up to James. Rod, many, many thanks for that. Uh, um, and welcome everyone to, uh, to, to this talk. So yeah, what I, what I want to talk to you about today is, well, provide an introduction to metabolomics um, from the perspective of mass spectrometry. It's uh, an area that we've been working in my group in for a number of years now, um, and it very much excites me. Uh, and I think partly because it's an area that's really developing and Rod and I just sort of touched on that as, as, as some people were joining partly because it's, it's um, uh, really kind of flexes the muscles of mass spectrometry in many ways. It, it, uh, it really requires all of the capabilities that, that mass spectrometry has to offer. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit in the, in the talk. Uh, and, and metabolomics also, it, I, I think, um, in my view anyway, um, and, and what I'd quite like to leave you with today, is it, it provides a really a new way of looking at biochemistry uh, or a new biochemistry approach in a way. I don't think it's just another tool in the toolbox for investigating biology. Actually, I think it, it's a way of seeing biology that, that we didn't have previously. And, and that sounds quite a sort of grandiose thing to say, but I, I'll get into the detail of why I, I think that. And I hope, hope I can leave that um, as a sort of at least an open question that, with you. Um, but it comes down to, to, to the way in which you go about looking at, at, at biology. And I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'll, I'll hopefully it'll become clear as we go through. So of course, uh, metabolomics uh, is one of uh, a number of different omics. I'm sure many of you will be aware of others. Genomics, of course, has sort of led the, the charge in many ways over the last few decades in terms of accessing uh, and um, sequencing and understanding the entire genome of various organisms, including, including the human genome. Um, and, um, uh, and then transcriptomics and proteomics have, uh, have come along and, and very important in terms of accessing those proteomes and transcriptomes that tell us not just what is potentially possible, but also what is actually happening in, um, uh, in reality in the samples and the, and the, and the organisms you're looking at. Uh, and metabolomics is very much the, the, um, the, the, uh, the most recent development in the omics techniques. And of course, access is, uh, tries to access small molecules uh, in biology. Uh, and understand those from a holistic perspective. So um, just before we get uh, into the detail, uh, just to, to, um, to, to let you know, so I, I run the mass spectrometry research facility in the chemistry department here in Oxford, have done since 2006, uh, but I also have a, a research group and that research group is where we focus on metabolomics. Uh, and um, uh, it's uh, really developed quite quickly. There's a really a strong, well, that was latent, but I think it's sort of coming to the fore, more, fore now more. Um, real need for metabolomics it, it, across the university in terms, of, uh, in, uh, in terms of the research that goes on. And I, I find myself increasingly collaborating really and having fun time doing it um, with, with a whole range of groups. Uh, a lot of them in medical sciences, uh, from oncology through to psychology and experimental psychology, um, as well as the physical scientists trying to understand sort of basic biology as well. Uh, and that's something that really I find absolutely fascinating and also um, a lot of fun. So I hope I can impart some of that today. So um, we'll have a little, what I want to sort of cover a little bit about what, what is metabolomics for those of you who are still uh, who, who are perhaps not quite sure um, and, and talk about it from this, this idea of a, a new biochemistry. Um, and I want to just take you through some of the experiments. So what is a metabolomics experiment look like? What are the kind of factors involved there and how do we put those together? Um, in order to try and understand what's happening in, in a biological system. Uh, one of the things that we do in my group um, is to work on new methodologies. So I mentioned that metabolomics is a really a young, um, a young omics technique. It's still very much in development. 
um, and it very much pushes the boundaries of mass spectrometry. Uh, and one of the areas there is, is around how do you actually characterize each of those individual metabolites uh, in a complex sample and technique development is important there. And we, we've been working on um, a number of areas actually. And one of them more recently, the more, uh, particularly sort of successful that we find is, is using iron chromatography as a way to access um, anions in biology are quite important, of course. Um, you know, a lot of energy transduction, central carbon metabolism, in fact, uh, are negatively charged ions, essentially. Um, so iron chromatography mass spectrometry, I think, has got a, a really bright future in, in metabolites. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done in that area. And so that was sort of a background, that sort of first half of the, of the talk. And then to, to, in the second part, I just want to take you through some, uh, a sort of step by step through some experiments we've done recently. Um, and how we've used metabolomics, both to try and understand the metabolic processes in a link to uh, cancer metabolism, to um, mutations in ISIS, uh, in particular those where cancer, cancer cells have a mutation in ISIS citrate dehydrogenase. It's quite common in a number of different cancers, including brain tumors, um, as a way to understand well, what are the, what are the, what's the impact on metabolism of these mutations. And then finally, to, 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 to look at uh, how we can use metabolomics to uh, probe the effects of uh, drug treatments on uh, on cells or on tissues um, and you know what are the effects of these drugs that we're, we're using um, in and uh, perhaps uh, above and beyond their therapeutic uh, targets. So that's what we'll look at. Um, so what is metabolomics? Well um, there are a number of different definitions if you go and google metabolomics but it, I think it's encapsulated in the sort of in the, in the text I've put up here so metabolomics aims to comprehensively characterize and quantify metabolites in complex biological systems in order to interpret biochemical function and so in some ways then metabolomics is sort of defined by the approach being to uh, to interpret biology interpret biochemistry and uh, interpret the small molecule metabolism that, that takes place in cells and tissues uh, and indeed is also found in, in biofluids as well. And I've, I've shown here on the, I'm not sure if you can see my, you probably can't see my, um, sorry, Rod, I don't know if you can tell, can you see my cursor? I'm not, I didn't check that, maybe I need to press on. I can see your cursor. Sorry? I can see your cursor. You can see my cursor. Okay, good, I assume others can too. Um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so, so obviously we've got a cell car um, um, caricature of a cell here. Um, and of course, we've actually got a very detailed knowledge of biochemistry, a detailed knowledge of the metabolism that takes place in cells. And you might ask yourself the question, why, why do we need to um, use a technique like metabolomics to, to tell us what's happening if we've got these very detailed metabolic maps? And of course, the, the answer to that is really um, a, a little bit unlike genomics and a little bit less like transcriptomics. Um, one of the most dynamic aspects of the cell is that me metabolic process. So um, metabolism is very uh, um, capable of producing energy in different ways. We know cancer cells, of course, produce energy um, it, it transform the way they produce energy quite significantly. But also other areas of metabolism, so the substrates that are used and the, the, and the route that you take to get to ATP is, is, can be quite different. And ultimately, um, we're finding out increasingly that um, the environment of the cell, so both the genetics of, sorry, start with the genetics. So the genetics of the cell, of course, dictate what possible metabolism can take place. But then the environment of the cell as well is influencing what metabolism actually takes place in interaction, not just because you've got dietary metabolites that come into the cell from, from, uh, from outside the body, not just because the level of oxygen in the atmosphere affects the, the biochemistry of the cell in terms of hypoxia, the hypoxic level, et cetera, but also because those small molecules that, that are, are, originate externally modulate the expression of genes. They modulate the ability of proteins to be able to function. Uh, and so there's very much, uh, well, I see this metabolism as this nexus between the uh, genetic profile that provides the, the sort of template for what can happen and, and then the environment that actually modulates what does happen. And I think it's for that reason that metabolomics and understanding metabolism uh, is really important to do in specific systems like disease systems. And I'll focus on disease here, but metabolomics is, is, is applied more broadly, of course. But in disease studies, um, we're increasingly realizing that um, some of the most important aspects are the metab metabolic changes that take place in conjunction with um, mapping the, the mutations that we know occur. So I think um, 
um, it's the, this nexus and this dynamic nexus between the, 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 uh, the genome and the exposome. So what the cell actually is exposed to, that's really the, the two really important factors in determining what metabolism actually takes, occurs. Um, and we do know, of course, I mean, that, that all of these external factors, you know, things like smoking, diet, age, and exercise, independent from disease, these have an, a direct impact on that, pro, uh, that metabolome. Uh, but of course, then in disease, things like the immune response, um, infection, inflammation, these are all going to modulate metabolism uh, as well. So metabolomics um, can be split into two approaches. Uh, the first uh, is uh, a sort of discovery mode, uh, and this is one that um, aims to capture the entire metabolome or as much of the metabolome as possible in the system that one is investigating, so in cells or tissues or a whole organism. Um, the, the idea is to measure as many of those metabolites as possible, not necessarily identify all of those, but measure them and measure their relative abundances. And um, the real benefit in doing that is that it's a hypothesis-free experiments. In fact, it's a hypothesis generating experiment and doesn't take any a priori um, ideas about the way that that system should work or, or may work that, that dictates what it is you're going to be looking at. So um, discovery metabolomics uh, measures all the small molecules or as many of them as possible in, in the system and then maps what happened, what, how those change in abundance uh, in relation to some sort of imposed uh, uh, biological variation, so um, biological change. So you might be comparing a, a mutation, a mutated uh, gene versus the the wild type, for example. That you would control all the other factors and just look at the difference in metabolism as a result of that. Or um, a treated cell with with a new drug versus an untreated, and uh, many many other. You can imagine all the experiments, but you can do that and then generate hypotheses about which pathways look like they're being affected as a result of doing that. Uh, and then that comes on to the second approach, which is a targeted metabolomics approach, where you would have some sort of hypothesis already. Quite often that would be generated by the discovery approach. Uh, and you might say, well, I think uh, glycolysis is affected by uh, this change in energy substrate. And, and it looks like that from the untargeted analysis. So uh, targeted uh, metabolomics really is, is um, enables you to quantify and look in more detail at those pathways that, that appear to be changing. Uh, and um, we'll look a little bit about how you go about those two types of experiment. Uh, and this just shows a little bit of a sort of data view. So an untargeted experiment might give you a plot that you, you could generate a plot like this. This is actually, sorry, I haven't labeled the, the x-axis. This is log fold change for individual metabolites. Each of these circles is a metabolite. Uh, and then on the x-axis, you've got, sorry, log uh, p-value on the y-axis. So the significance of the change. And then on the x-axis, you've got fold change here. Uh, and so things up in the, 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 the right and the left quadrant are things that are going to be both changing quite a lot in abundance, but also highly significant in terms of the, the way we've captured those changes. So in this example, we can see there are more things that go down than they than, than go up in the comparison that's being made. So that's, we don't need to know what these metabolites are initially in order to capture the important ones. And then we'd need to go in and identify what those are in order to um, try and interpret what's happening. And of course, the targeted analysis here. Uh, this is a, a box plot showing that there's the, the, the significance of the change for a specific metabolite that we might have captured up here. Um, and we can see we can do that in a number of different biological replicates uh, and show that there's a significant change uh, between here a wild type and a mutant cell, for example. So, um, so that's um, a bit of an idea of, of how metabolomics experiments may, you may go about them. Um, and I said at the beginning, I, I'd like to talk about how uh, mass spectrometry um, is used in metabolomics. Now, mass spectrometry is not the only analytical technique that's used, um, NMR and other spectroscopies are, are, are often used as well. But I think mass spectrometry, well, certainly mass spectrometry uh, is the area that uh, the, the technique that we use. Uh, and I think it has, I mean, it has three things going for it that I think are really important uh, in, in, the, in the metabolomics experiment. Now, I just put up here, you can, it, it's, this is a uh, this is a quadrupole time of flight schematic of, 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 of a mass spectrometer cutaway and, and I've labeled things up, well the things are labeled up, I didn't do it, but uh, um, I think this is a water system uh, given, the, given the W mode that they're showing, but that's immaterial I, and, and it doesn't matter which configuration you have here. Um, it's the fact that mass spectrometry has this capability, so, so the three S's is what I call them. The first thing is the sensitivity uh, to, um, to analyze small molecules. So um, Cells, for example, you know, they're going to 
um, other biologists will correct me, but I think, you know, we're talking at least five, maybe six orders of magnitude in, in terms of the abundances of different metabolites, you know, from glucose in the millimolar range uh, down to things very much down in the femtomolar and, and probably lower as well, but that, that gets challenging to, to, um, to detect. But sensitivity is very important so we can get down to those low levels in order to access comprehensively what's happening uh, or what the, the small molecule profiles from cells and tissues looks like. So sensitivity is very much determined, I'm circling here the lock spray, but this is the ionization source. This is really what determines the sensitivity. Uh, a mass spectrometry is extremely sensitive and let's just technique full stop. Uh, the second um, aspect of a mass spectrometer is the selectivity uh, that it can provide. Uh, and this is really the ability to, ca to capture individual metabolite measurements uh, in amongst uh, a very complex, you know, from a very complex sample where we're, we're measuring as many of those small molecules as possible. So, and this is where mass spectrometry is quite interesting. So, so as a technique, it's been used historically and is uh, very important for being very selective uh, because you're interested in one thing. Um, now, um, you know, one, one metabolite or one, one, one analyte or a few, uh, and, and it's very um, good at being able to filter out all of the rest in order to be able to focus on that. But it's, it's the, set, the specificity that you can, you can bring uh, and the selectivity you can, you can bring using mass spectrometry to enable you to look at many, many analytes at the same time uh, that I think really makes it useful in, in, in metabolomics. So um, the ability to isolate uh, individual metabolites using a quadrupole here, for example, uh, and then to do an experiment such as collision-induced dissociation, and then measure the, the fragments of each of those individual metabolites and do that consecutively. Uh, as you perhaps have a, a chromatography system at the front separating, initially separating metabolites from a complex mixture that, you know, could be many thousands of metabolites um, from a cell extract, for example. And to be able to then get that select specific information for each of those metabolites over time and collect all of that into a single uh, experimental data set. That's really the key aspect, I think, along with the sensitivity that uh, mass spectrometry brings for metabolomics. Okay, so um, moving on to the workflow, I just wanted to go through the workflow really, the workflow that we use in our lab, just to sort of familiarize you with, with the process. And, and it's in sort of far, four parts really. I mean, the first of course is um, what, what it is you look at. So the samples themselves um, and also how you then design the experiment. So, I mean, the beauty of, mass, uh, of metabolomics is you can really look at uh, so many types of samples and you can think of an infinite number of very interesting, well, I think very interesting types of experiments. So, you know, get all, all, all the way from sort of blood plasma. I mean, some of the work, for example, we're doing this week is, is looking at blood plasma from patients with COVID-19, uh, comparing it with healthy plasma and um, interested in what are the metabolic changes uh, that, that result from COVID-19 infection. Um, and, you know, one of these, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, an experiment that's ongoing in the lab. We're also, interested in well, what, what, what those who had a severe effect from uh, infection uh, with, from, from COVID-19 versus those that have a mild, you know, is there a metabolic readout? Is there some metabolic profile that's uh, giving us some clues as to why that might be? Um, so, so that's something we're looking at. Um, whole organisms or small organisms here, you know, you could have, um, you know, this is a, a mosquito, but uh, a, a malarial mosquito, for example, but it could be, uh, you know, not, small molecules, um, organisms that are fed different energy substrates, you know, different uh, dietary molecules, maybe feeding off different types of, of uh, fruit, for example. Brain uh, tissue, uh, so tumor tissue versus healthy tissue from the same brain. Um, uh, and then of course, tissue culture, which is an important, it's important model type because we can, although tissue culture doesn't represent physiology and, and what happens in a, in a live human or, or animal, it uh, directly, um, it, it does provide us with that cellular model um, that can often have a genetic profile that really mimics a disease, for example, and it's highly controllable. So this is one of the things we really like about it in metabolomics. It's still got thousands of metabolites. It's still going to be um, a challenging analytical task, but it can contain, um, we, can, we can manipulate the genetics, we can ma manipulate the environment in a way that's more challenging to do for live organisms, for example. So we do a lot of models uh, in terms of tissue culture. Now the experimental design, I mean, I'll come back, I'll come on to that in a moment, but that's an important factor here. But once we've prepared our samples, um, and essentially, I mean, whatever the sample is, I, I should say, you know, we want to basically capture that small molecule profile that was, that was present 
in vivo it was present in it or you know in, in, in the functioning organism as it were or the cells before you started to extract the metabolites we want to keep that profile and so we we do a really simple extract we mush up the sample effectively um, add some solvent and then pull out the small molecule filter out the large molecules like proteins and dna to leave a small molecule profile and we we, you know, we've done a lot of work and people do a lot of work to make sure that in that process, um, and we keep it as simple as possible, uh, in that process, we're not disturbing that profile in a way, you know, that there's lots of things that could, I mean, a filter, for example, you know, might hang on to lipids more than it does to hydrophilic molecules, for example, or vice versa, right? So we need to test all of those things. Um, but we've got, but, but in, 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 in that, uh, you know, there, there are protocols that we use that, uh, that that's not, that's, uh, that's fairly robust. So we then, um, this is part of lysing and then filtering. Uh, and then once we've, we've have our, essentially our small molecule profile in, in, a, in a methanol or ethanol uh, extract quite commonly, we then store those at minus 80. Uh, and that's quite important actually. So minus 80 is a sort of default. If you store things down in the fridge or into, in, even in the freezer, in a, a conventional freezer at minus 20, um, you start to see metabolic interactions and metabolic changes over time. And so and degradation, particularly through freeze and, freeze and thaw, actually. So you want to freeze only once and thaw once, and also make sure you keep things um, pretty much indefinitely, but at minus 80, it's fine. Once you've ready to do the analysis, of course, LCMS is, is an approach we take. GCMS is another one that some people use. Um, LCMS, we find it's more flexible. It gives us more methodologies that can access the different physico physiochemical properties that we find sort of mixed up in those. Uh, small molecule extracts from biological samples. Uh, and that gets us through to some data. Uh, and that's um, um, what we need to do next then is of course the last part. And that is to say, well, how can we take that data set and both process and analyze that data in such a way that we can then interpret what's happening in biology. And that's obviously in some ways the most important part of what we're doing. Um, but in order to get this, for this to be effective, all the rest of this has to be super good. Uh, and what I mean by super good is we've got to minimize all of the biases and the errors that are propagated throughout any type of workflow. Um, right from, you know, how, uh, which types of, of sample you actually choose, um, how you normalize for the number of cells or the volume of plasma or whatever, uh, through to um, the dilution, how accurately you add the, the solvent, all of those things have an impact because ultimately this in a metabolomics experiment is comparing lots, hopefully, lots of biological replicates. Uh, it's going to have some analytical replicates as well. Uh, and we're going to be really looking at the differences in abundance uh, of the small molecules between the experimental groups. So we want to make them as, as comparable as possible. So going back, oh well, just looking at that in a little bit more detail, because uh, the, the, the really important bits can start right at the beginning. So, so what kind of experimental design are we going to then put together here? And there are two approaches that are taken generally in metabolomics. The first one is a simple case versus control. And I've, I've sort of hinted at that with the blood plasma from COVID patients, for example, already. Um, but it could be other things, sort of mutant versus wild type disease versus healthy male, female, etc. You know, any, any sort of different binary compatibility comparison can be made and um, you know we'd have um, we'd have um, a number of replicates from each group to try and capture um, bio biological variability is important particularly for patient samples particularly for organisms um, it's easier to control cells so usually the biological variability in two cell cell types is is min uh, two, two batches of cells is minimal but of course you might be interested in two cell types where there's a different bi uh, genetic background and that's then uh, leads to more variability and then, I mean, that's a, that's a snapshot in time and that's a binary comparison and it's the most straightforward approach. Another way you can, of course, you might want to design your experiments is to know what happens over time uh, or know what happens as you treat a, a subject or an individual um, over, a, over a time course. Um, so that might be, just, uh, might be just what happens over time. Uh, and, and, and down here you can see there's, you know, uh, somebody who does exercise uh, and you have different time points, you might be collecting their blood plasma, uh, and then male versus female here, and you can you can compare two factors, so both um, non-exercise and exercise in male and female, for example. Um, here we've got a time series where we're treating uh, an experimental mouse model with uh, a drug, and we want to know what happens at time point one, two, three, four in the same subject. So often this is a within subject time series type of experiment, uh, and these uh, these are the two approaches that we would normally take. 
Um, coming back to that sample preparation in that workflow that I just showed. So of course, and I, I mentioned this, so we wanna make sure that we're capturing the, the endogenous small molecule profile. And actually that's sort of, sort of easier said than done in many ways. So even if you've got a simple dish of cells here, We've got some metabolic reactions that are really quite rapid. I mean, you know, in a, within a few seconds, you'll see changes in abundances. And ATP and ADP, for example, are, are, are uh, important energy metabolites. And those, those are very rapid response metabolites in terms of the abundance changes. Um, and so capturing the endogenous profile, um, uh, what we often do is actually to pour in liquid nitrogen onto our cells at the point we want to start to harvest them to really cool down rapidly those cells. And that really reduces the essentially the kinetics of the reactions that are taking place. So you really slow those down. Uh, and so you've essentially stopped them uh, with, with liquid nitrogen. And then to do an extract, so a lysing of those cells, an extraction of the small molecules into the solvent as rapidly as possible. So we'd pour in liquid nitrogen, we'd pour on ethanol or methanol, um, and we'd disrupt the cells with a scraper, et cetera. And combining those two um, is, is very effective. If we did all this at room temperature and we just scrape the cells off, you'd see very bit, you would start to see differences in some metabolites. Obviously, others are much less labile and things. So, um, and, and some of those would be really changed. And this is, um, you know, if we zoom in on the cell and then we zoom in on the me metabolites that are present, this is just trying to show that the, the chemical heterogeneity present is really significant in metabolomics. Um, and much more so than proteomics, of course, much more so than uh, genomics, because those. Um, although there may be more, uh, there may be a, a, a greater variety of genes, a greater variety of protein forms in cells, that's certainly the case, um, their, their molecular similarities are much greater. So, you know, obviously um, all, all proteins are made up of the, the, the 18 to 20 uh, protein genetic amino acids, for example. So they've all got an amino acid sequence to them that can be captured. And, and again, the base pair sequences in, gene in, in the genome much more physicochemical heterogeneity. And this is really part of the problem and why one of the reasons why metabolomics has spent some time uh, is, is, is one of the youngest omics techniques and there's still a lot of technical development in capturing this heterogeneity. It's really important. Um, but once we've, once we've arrested metabolism and we captured that small molecule profile, we then uh, need to analyze it. And I, I mentioned mass spectrometry for this and I've just shown a few other uh, techniques that are used in metabolomics. Uh, as well, but we'll, we'll focus for the rest of this talk on, on liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, um, in the work that, from, from the work that we do. Okay, so um, this is a this is actually um, a, a, a total ion chromatogram from the LCMS analysis of a standard mixture of metabolites that we use that we run alongside all of our um, biological analyses, and this has about 180 small molecules. Um, uh, metabolites uh, as standards. And so we use this to make sure that we can actually use in our, um, our experimental samples, we can use the retention time because we can match those up. They should be very close to each other. We can match those up uh, along with the accurate mass values and, and a few other parameters I'll look at. Um, and of course, what we can do from this total ion chromatogram is create something like this. This is an extracted ion chromatogram for any of the mass to charge values that we might um, measure. Uh, and from that uh, extracted ion chromatogram, we can, we can determine the peak area. That's something that can be automated. Uh, and that peak area now, because it was derived, this is a, a liquid chromatography mass spec experiment, and this is a total ion chromatogram. Uh, this area is now proportional to the amount of that metabolite that was in the sample. And this is really the metric that we're using in metabolomics. We want to know whether this area uh, is the same or different between our two experimental groups or our time series, whatever it is. Um, has it been modulated by the induced biological vari variable, that we're, variable that we're looking at or variables that we're looking at? And of course, um, what we need to do then is do this process uh, for all of, not just this, this is the standards, but in our biological samples, across each sample, we want to take all of those NZ values and create this value. Um, and put that into a data set because for the untargeted experiment, that's exactly what we want to know. We want to know for all of these NZ values, um, are they changing? Um, this is just showing, it's, it's more difficult to see this actually um, because of the way it's put together, but this is showing what that might look like if we did it in two dimensions. So here's um, retention time. This is along, along here, retention time, and then the accurate mass NZ value. And it's showing that sort of two dimensional space um, once you've done this 
Um, so where you see essentially metabolite or compound features um, across the LCMS run. It's quite interesting. I mean, you know, things, if you're a, if you're a mass spectrometrist or a, a, um, a high kinetic te technique um, a specialist, um, you, you know, you'd see, well, this is, this is interesting, but this of course is right at the beginning of the run. This is the void volume, for example. So these are, these are, these are ends of values you measure, but they're not chromatographically resolved using this, this technique. And down here actually is also right at the end of the run, this sort of mass here, uh, this, this, uh, um, this blue kind of uh, range of, of, of data points here. This is the, what's coming out in the wash at the end when you, you ramp up your organic solvent concentration just to elute things that are really uh, hydrophobic, right? So in, in, a, in a reverse phase chromatography uh, experiment anyway. Uh, so these things are going to be quite lipid-like, for example. These things are going to be quite hydrophilic. In fact, they may be ionic. And things in here, if it was reverse phase chromatography, would be well captured by the method. But it does highlight that obviously it's not capturing everything. Uh, and so it's one of the reasons we need to have multiple methods, um, which is what we do, what multiple chromatographic methods, which is one of the things that we do. Uh, and also to develop methodologies that try and capture more of this chemical space. And so, uh, yeah, so, so an area that we're focused on uh, is iron chromatography. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, this is, this is obviously, um, this is as old as the hills, of course. So iron chromatography is uh, one of the really substantial and um, uh, chromatography techniques that's been around for many years since the 19, uh, earlier than 1960s. Um, and, um, uh, but it's not been one of those main chromatographic techniques that's been coupled directly to mass spectrometry unlike reverse phase chromatography, unlike hillic chromatography, unlike uh, iron pairing chromatography and other types of, um, of important chromatographies. And the reason for that is really just the incompatibility at this stage here. So um, iron chromatography is basically, I won't go into the details here, but iron chromatography is based around eluting compounds that are stuck uh, ionically onto your column by having a higher strength ionic um, interaction from the mobile phase. So you'd have either a, 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 an acid that would, elu an acid or a base eluent, or possibly a high salt content. So, you know, for, for example, if you had um, uh, potassium sulfate, you have, uh, sulfate ions might exchange for other cations that were stuck on slightly less strongly than sulfate would. And that exchange would then allow those um, analytes to elute. The problem is obviously you've got your mobile phase that's very high ionic strength coming in and electrospray ionization, which is one of the default approaches for sensitivity that is used in metabolomics and obviously a whole range of other mass spectrometry experiments is very sensitive to salt concentration. So uh, effectively it's, it's not possible to do that direct coupling. Otherwise you simply just clog up your ion source and you get um, ion concentrations that really, you know, we're just reflecting the fact that you've got lots of ion strength there rather than the analyte abundance. So uh, one of the tricks has been, and it's and it's taken a while to filter through to chromatography, is to have what this is suggest this 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 signifies here, the SRS electrolytic ion suppressor. This essentially um, is a unit that uh, sorry sorry two things. I'll go back to this one first. So here you've got an electrolytic reservoir. I, I just mentioned you, and this is actually a hydroxide ion um, gradient, and so it's generating hydroxide ions. But then this unit here is a suppressor that will remove. Uh, that high hydroxide ion concentration uh, from the eluent before it goes into the mass spectrometer. And it essentially does that electro electrolytically by converting the hydroxide or well, splitting water into um, protons and, and hydroxide ions and then um, using those protons uh, preferentially to, to neutralize the hydroxide ion eluent stream that goes through the middle. Um, and so you end up converting hydroxide to neutral water, which is pretty okay for electrospray and so uh, that fairly um, effectively allows you to use iron chromatography with mass spec. And as I said at the beginning, that opens up a whole new range of um, much more um, hydrophilic uh, metabolites, which tend to be uh, what biology is favored, particularly for central carbon metabolism. So if you look at glycolysis and you look at pentose phosphate pathway, TCA cycle, um, nucleic acid metabolism, a lot of those are, are, are negatively charged ions. Uh, and so um, this ion chromatography mass spectrometry is an important sort of additional chromatography technique for accessing those areas. Now, this is just a little, you know, a difficult, a snapshot of a difficult area, okay? So, so I mentioned gl uh, glycolysis. This is, this is actually a number of the glycolytic intermediates are found here because these are sugar monophosphates. Uh, and sugar monophosphates are challenging for mass spectrometry. In fact, mass spectrometry on its own is completely unable to differentiate any of them 
simply because they are all isobaric species. They all have exactly the same uh, mass, mz value. Uh, and um, for that reason, if you didn't separate them chromatographically, there would be a single peak for all of these species. And this is a real cell extract. This is showing that actually using ion chromatography, we can start to differentiate uh, those uh, sugar monophosphates, um, which we would otherwise not be able to do. And there are, there are very few uh, chromatography techniques that are able to do this. Um, so it opens up a really kind of fundamental area of energy transduction in terms of metabolism uh, that is actually really challenging to do otherwise. And I think it just e emphasizes a little bit the, the challenges that, that the metabolomics still faces um, and the importance of technique development, um, being able to try and capture more effectively that, that entire metabolome, um, which is very much an ongoing um, project in the field. Uh, and this just map just shows you a little bit how we open up that space. So the iron chromatography that I just mentioned is opening up this more polar region uh, where there's a more ionic polar um, profile than HILIC, for example, which for those who are familiar with HILIC, that's another approach for, for, for the analysis of more polar metabolites. Reverse phase chromatography is brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic, but um, very much sits in the middle between polar and non-polar metabolites. So it captures lipids very well, slightly more polar, metabolites but not the ionic um, ones that we we see and actually that's that was what was reflected in the void volume for example. Okay so um, it's an important to think about what happens to this data once we've collected because you know we're, we're interested in, in the um, comprehensiveness of what we can capture particularly for the discovery metabolomics experiment and um, so what we need to do is make sure that we can comprehensively put that together into a single data set for analysis. So the first thing that we would do is that what we call peak picking, and that would be taking those NZ values, linking them to a retention time, uh, and making sure that we're comparing like for like from one sample to the next across those biological replicates, for example, and indeed uh, the, 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 the experimental groups that we're looking at. And that's pretty good, um, and pretty straightforward to do in many ways, but it has to be um, automated. We're talking about thousands of small molecules from a single run. Um, tens to hundreds of thousands of, of, of data points, of course, across a, an experiment. And so that, that needs to be done um, in a way that allows for some alignment of the chromatography, which from one run to the next is not going to be absolutely the same. I mean, it's going to be the same within a second or two, but we need to make sure that if you've got a thousand, well, let's say you've got 3000 things eluting across a 20 minute run, of course, there's going to be multiple coalutions. And there is a chance that some of those are going to be isobaric if you're looking at those sugar monophosphates, for example. So you've got to make sure uh, that you can compare them like for like. Um, so, so that's the first part here. Uh, and there's a this sort of data quality control aspect to that. And there's the peak alignment process just illustrated. So we, we make sure that this, 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 is, this is something that's automated, but manually curated, I suppose, in metabolomics. It, 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 manually in the sense that you can go in and have a look and see what's happened and agree with it or not. Um, you don't have to do it for every peak. And then finally, I mean, an important aspect of mass spectrometry, that selectivity is fantastic, but it also comes with a lot of heterogeneity. So um, those mass spectrometrists amongst you will know all about um, different types of adducts of the same um, chemical species. And of course, we see that in biology a lot. So there's lots of sodium around, um, even potassium. And, you know, can we very easily see three different NZ values for exactly the same metabolite simply because in the ionization of that metabolite, we've seen a proteinated form, we see the sodiated form and the potassiated form as well. And of course, we, we want to capture all of that as representing a single metabolite, right? So we're interested in the abundance. And, and so it's really the aggregate of those signals that we're interested in. Uh, and so we need software because of course, this is going to be the case for every, well, potentially for every metabolite, every compound feature that we measure across many samples, that's thousands and thousands of signals, we need to automate that process. And so we capture all of that in an automated way. And there's obviously, we use software and there's software from instrument manufacturers. There's also independent software that now that's really well developed to do all of this for us um, in a way that we can view what's happening. We can dig in and see uh, if we don't believe how, you know, we, we don't believe it's done, it's doing a great job. But in general, the software is very good at all of this. And once you've done all of this, you can now then basically put together a data table that has um, on your, the first column here, all the way down here, this is, the, this is the top kind of few percent of a table that will go on and on over 5,000 compound features in this experiment. So that goes down 5,000 down there um, across a number of different um, 
biological replicates that go across a number of different experimental groups. In this case, a binary, a two, two group comparison, wild type uh, positive and wild type negative. And there are five replicates of those in each. Um, and um, the, the, the boxes are filled in by this peak area, right? So these peak areas are those um, integrated peak areas here that we, um, we identified that's been automated and identified. Uh, and so it's really those peak areas that we're going to be comparing and we're going to be comparing those as a group between one experimental group and then the second experimental group as well. Um, just quickly to, um, to go into uh, how we might identify metabolites at this point, because we don't need to have done that yet. We've got accurate mass analysis that we can do. That's essentially going to give us a chemical formula. Uh, we've got um, retention time that I mentioned. This is really good because it's, it's actually a very, it captures quite a lot of information. It captures structural information. So we can different, if we've got the right chromatography, we differentiate uh, structural isomers from each other that have the same MZ value. Um, and if our chromatography is also very reproducible, you know, we can rely on that as being a, an identifier. Um, but we put all these together. So we also then check the isotope matching to make sure it reflects the chemical formula that we're predicting from the accurate mass value. And then finally, we'd also have um, a fragmentation pattern as well that comes from tandem mass spectral analysis of each of those features as they go through the instrument. Um, and so putting all those four together gives us a sort of triangulation, as it were, of um, data, uh, analytical information from each of the MZ values we've measured that allows us then to match against the database uh, and to say this is highly likely that this, this metabolite is X, Y, or Z, for example. Now, clearly, um, so the reality is that we can't identify all those compound features, but we can we can start to use this approach to identify uh, a number of them. So um, once we've done that, we've got a data, uh, a sort of large data file, essentially. Uh, we need to go through and do two things. I mean, the, the next step is then to kind of recognize um, using a number of different uh, visualization statistical analysis tools uh, to, to look at what the differences are and to drill down in to look at which metabolites have changed. And that's what's captured here by these sort of workflow here. This is using different classification approaches. I, I, I'm not going to go into all those details here, but you recognize the box plot where you can see significant changes. Um, things like hierarchical clustering and multivariate statistical analysis all provide ways of modeling that data. And that's, um, that's really important. And then the next thing to do is what you do once you've done that, you've found these statistically significant changes. The last part then is to interpret those biologically. And that usually means finding a way of translating this has gone up or this has gone down to a biological context. So either a network type of analysis or a pathways type analysis, or indeed a whole sort of genome network type analysis as well. So that, that sort of gets us to the end of that first half, first part of the talk. And, and that um, gives us an overview of the metabolomics experiments, type of experiments and, and what we're trying to achieve. Um, this is a slide is just a holding slide really to sort of show that, you know, once you have that overall workflow, you can then apply that in a whole range of areas, of course, and that metabolomics is now reaching out and has been for a number of years into a whole range of, of application areas across um, different types of scientific discipline. And I just wanna focus in here a little bit in this talk on, um, drug discovery and, and biomarker discovery uh, and just under and, and, and what we can tell about the underlying um, disease etiology and how that's reflected in, in the metabolic processes that we can identify. So I'm just going to zoom in on that in, in an, an example. Um, and this is one that comes from research that's been going on in my group uh, for, for a number of years actually now. And this, this, this really started out like sort of a lot of research really just a sort of um, a chat really um, uh, with, with people uh, from, from um, neuropathology, uh, Olaf and Zorge and, and, and others there um, interested in um, brain tumors that uh, it was found in 2008, these uh, most gra grade two and three gliomas, so the most common types of brain tumor, they have this mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase, which is, um, uh, is an enzyme that converts citrate to isocitrate in the TCA cycle, it's found both in the mitochondria, but also this reaction takes place in the cytoplasm. Uh, and this mutated isocitrate dehydrogenase leads to, um, leads to elevation of 2-hydroxyglutrate, which is an endogenous metabolite, the sort of a bit of a dead end in metabolism, certainly not sort of significantly known prior to this, but it's now become an oncometabolite, a metabolite that's recognized across various cancers, not just brain tumors, as being significantly modulated uh, and has um, 
uh, potentially, uh, uh, you know, can be used for uh, diagnostic and prognostic uh, functionality that's still sort of in pipeline in terms of clinical uh, applications, but we, we, we've done work on this um, uh, with neuropathology and also in, in MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So we've been able to identify changes in, uh, sorry, in, in 2-hydroxyglutarate in vivo as well. But um, we, we, were inter we became interested in, well, what are the metabolic changes in general? So can we use metabolomics to say, well, when you have an isocitrate dehydrogenase mutation that leads to elevated 2-HG levels, what's really the metabolic background to that? What's happening? And are there clues about disease etiology that we can gather? So we went about that sort of study. And um, I'm not going to go through the study in detail because I, we don't have time to do that today. But I just want to give you an overview of of how we, we went about that and, and to, to sort of illustrate the way in which we can use metabolomics. So um, the first thing is, is this slide is, is simply saying, so the first thing we can do, we knew a priori from, from the previous work that 2-hydroxyglutarate levels change. So we wanted to make sure we could characterize that. And of course, if we get the standard, we can run that in a, in a plasma extract or in a cell extract as a spike standard. That's a straightforward you know, experimental approach and we can get the retention time and the accurate mass value. So we're on our way to be able to detect that. And of course, then we can do a uh, serial dilution. So we get a, a linear response curve. So we can actually work out the amounts of 2-hydroxyglutrate in our samples as well. Um, and um, we can quantify that. Now, one of the things that became clear is that 2-hydroxyglutrate that, um, is an enantiomeric uh, molecule. It means there can be a sort of right-handed and left-handed enantiomer, and so there's the chiral. There's a chiral center to it, um, mm. and it turns out that there's there basically there's a left-handed and a right-handed version of the molecule in 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 uh, endogenously, and normally that would be the L and the D form um, in the wild type with sort of equal equal uh, an equal concentration of each, um, and so. Um, one of the things that became clear is that when we look at the mutant cells, that there's a differential now. And in fact, it's only one of those enantiomers that is elevated. Uh, and it's uh, the other one, the L form is not elevated in any way that these aren't in comparison. So it's not gone down. They're, it's basically, they're the same sort of level as the wild type cells, um, but the, the elevations in the D form. So this is interesting. So what this is, I mean, there's an interesting story that I'm not going to go into, but that is that, you know, that basically tumor biology is selected for a specific enantiomer. Uh, and, and a, a mutation that leads to a change of function. That is unusual. I mean, it's often the case that you get a mutation, but that mutation often just leads to a loss of function, in a, which may be important in tumor genesis, but this change of function implies that D2-hydroxyglutrate is in some way an important factor in the development of the tumor. And so this is one of the reasons we were very interested in it. So we did, we, we decided to do some cell model studies first. And, and so we did, um, what you can hopefully imagine from, from what I've been saying so far. So we decided to do a case control type experiment. We got some LN18 um, IDH wild type uh, cells. Those, those are glioblastoma cells that are just the wild type. And we also then, um, we did a, a, a got sort of virally transfected mutant. So overexpressing the mutant of IDH uh, in another set. And we did some um, tissue culture replicates and we did a comparison and metabolomics experiment, right? So this is just, uh, the workflow of sample preparation, data analysis. And then we wanted to ask some questions of that data. So what are the metabolic differences in general? Um, are there sort of biomarkers that are, or things that are changing significantly other than 2-HG? Uh, and, and then can we actually uh, put those into a biological context? What metabolic pathways are being affected, if, if any, um, in addition to this change that we're seeing? So, um, so one of the things that we did, we did all those, the, 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 those type of experiment, uh, the, you know, sample preparation and analysis. Uh, and then we, we took that as data, those large data sets, and we started to do some statistical analysis first. And this is a principal component plot. We use these a lot, actually. I mean, and, and we don't use these actually to tell us a lot about biology, but we use them to see whether there are, in principle, biological changes that are important, uh, and also to see how well our analysis has gone. So, if you've got two experimental groups that are biologically different, a PCA plot um, is capturing in each of these, these circles, which is representing a sample from the experimental group. And in this case, red is the uh, mutant and green is the wild type. And these are IDH mutant and wild type cells. Um, the, each of those spots is a sample and the position on this two dimensional plot is the sum of all of the metabolite peak areas that we've measured. 
And so this, this spot could move around basically depending on the overview or, or the, the, the overall profile of the peak areas for all of the thousands of metabolites that were actually measured underneath each of these. And so of course, if, we, if the two groups fall separately like this, it's not because the system or the statistical algorithm or whatever knows that there are two groups. We've just, we've basically essentially color coded them. It's because that overall metabolic composition is different. Uh, and of course, you can see here that they're very much separated from each other, the mutants and the wild type. And that tells us two things. I mean, what it tells us, that's the spread we get in biological, well, tissue culture, biological variability. It looks like there's a bit of an outlier here, but of course it doesn't seem to be actually changing the story very much. Um, and also it tells us that, you know, under, uh, that there are going to be changes in individual metabolites here as well. So we, we use this as a sort of first, first pass to say, well, it looks like there's something interesting going on. Of course, it might be that these are very much coalescing. This is an extreme change. So we wouldn't often see quite such an extreme change as this. And, and, it's, and it's partly the result of the two HG changes that we see. They, they go up hundreds of fold. So become very, very high abundance metabolite. But um, uh, often you'd, you'd see a sort of partial overlap, you'd see, um, um, uh, and that would indicate that uh, the fact that it's not a complete overlap would indicate there are differences. Uh, and this comes back to that um, uh, volcano plot I've shown as I've illustrated already. Uh, this shows us um, a way of combining both significantly altered abundance, but also, uh, well, significant altered abundance. There's both a significant change as well as a, um, a large fold change. And you can see things up here are going to be very, very high. Um, terms of the fold change between the groups and also statistically significant. Uh, and then if you plot those out using univariate statistics, so just simply plotting the, uh, well this is univariate statistics, there are whole, 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 whole approaches, we can plot them as box plot. You can see here that we get this elevation of 2-hydroxyglutarate down here, but just by way of comparison, just a couple of metabolites short of 2-hydroxyglutarate um, um, being derived from 2-oxyglutarate in the TCA cycle, you've got citrate which has not changed one little bit. And so this is very specific, and um, even though it's in the same locality, it's really, really a dramatic change. Um, a few other things seem to change, though, in the opposite direction, 2-oxyglutrate, which is essentially a metabolic precursor for 2-hydroxyglutrate, goes in the other direction. Uh, and then something else, cisconotate, there's a little bit of a change here, but nothing dramatic. Um, although that doesn't mean it's not important, um, of course. And it's worth actually just pointing that out. So, you know, focusing in on how big the change is, is actually missing quite a lot of biology there because um, certain pathways are going to be tightly regulated as in, 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 in general compared to others. And so it's easier to get a, a larger fold change in one pathway compared to another one. And actually the TCA cycle is very well um, regulated. And so any changes you find there are probably quite important. Um, other ways to look at this data, this is hierarchical clustering. This is now multivariate statistical analysis. And um, this gives us basically a way of looking at uh, ranking those metabolites or clustering them together, um, uh, showing how they change in a similar or different way. Um, and basically there's a heat map output to this so that the, the mutant, sorry, mutant is red, wild type is green. And you can see lots of things go down other than 2-hydroxyglutarate and lots of things are higher in the wild type other than 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is lower. Um, and what we can do once you've got this heat map approach is then do something like this, which is to take those um, increases and decreases and then map those onto known biochemical pathways, so known metabolic pathways. And this is um, a little bit difficult to interpret, and apologies for that, but um, what it was aiming to do is really um, bring together well, this here, which is the glycolytic pathway, the TCA cycle down here, uh, and then um, through here is the, uh, sorry, where is it? Um, yeah, through here is the pentose phosphate pathway and then it includes purine and pyrimidine metabolism, which are all connected, of course, and part of central energy, uh, central, central metabolism. Um, to see what's happening. And, you know, actually it's, it's not so obvious when you look at it like this, what it, well, it doesn't tell you what's happening. It shows you that things go up and down and there are some areas of green, which means things have gone down, areas of red, which mean things have gone up. There's a 2-hydroxyglutrate but other areas have gone down quite a bit as well. Um, so, um, and that's because what we've done is really take the fold change and, uh, and put it on here and show the direction of it, but not, the, not including the significance of those changes or indeed relating them to how important the pathways are, which is something we can do. Um, and that's um, related to quantitative, quantitative pathways analysis here. And this is another way of looking at those pathways. Um, and ranking them based on the importance of the change within them based on which metabolites are changing within the pathway. And in this way, we can actually start seeing here now that amino acid metabolisms, our previous view 
was really central carbon metabolism didn't include amino acid metabolism. In fact, many amino acid metabolism that really is changing here, perhaps more so than central energy metabolism, which is somewhere in the middle. It is changing a bit, but perhaps not as much. So I, I won't go into to the background to this, but this involves things like nodes and um, um, important meta metabolites that, that maybe link other pathways together. And just finally, um, just to say, so one of the things that came out of that was actually the amino acid metabolism being where, where things changed. And this is the lysine degradation pathway. And we found multiple metabolites, sacarapine, two amino adipate, two oxoadipate, popped out because they were, they were reducing quite dramatically in those mutant cells uh, in a number of, so where it's white, we weren't able to measure that metabolite. So it's quite possible this would also be green if we had, irrespective of multiple metabolites going down, there's no red here. So it looks like that pathway uh, is quite important and is modulated in, um, uh, in uh, or, or is, is, re uh, is reduced uh, in the mutant. Now, the next question is, of course, why is that the case? Why is there a depletion? And that's then our hypothesis, perhaps, that's been generated from that discovery type experiment. So we've, we've alighted on a pathway and we might want to know, well, is this important, really? Is this a sort of bystander? Is it because 2-hydroxyglutarate that is elevated is actually simply just inhibiting the enzymes here and that that's not that important because it's a degradation pathway. Or are there other reasons? Should we be looking at the expression of the enzymes that are involved here? Is there an interaction between 2-hydroxyglutarate and the genetic ex uh, the expression of the enzymes? Um, and both those experiments are fairly straightforward things to do uh, and so we could start to then build in some hypothesis to a more targeted experiment. Right, so that, that hopefully has illustrated a sort of simple approach that we can start to then develop hypotheses and, and, and probe the, the, uh, the metabolic pathways that are importantly changing without a prior hypothesis. And I, I'm aware that time is, is very much running out and I've got two more slides here that, that just um, move on to what, how we might um, investigate then uh, experimental uh, therapeutics, experimental drugs, inhibitors of those pathways if we then came up with a hypothesis through, through the target analysis that led to them th those pathways being potential targets. Uh, and so here, what we've done is we've now got a, a, an inhibitor of the 2-hydroxy, uh, the, the mutant 2-hydroxy, uh, sorry, the mutant um, IDH uh, enzyme that is overexpressed in these tumors. We've got an inhibitor that we know works. So what we decided to do was to test that in this type of metabolic model add those to cells, do our original mutant wild type, and then have a treated version, because that we know reduces the 2-hydroxyglutarate levels. And so we could see which metabolic changes, like the lysine degradation pathway, for example, uh, are modulated by the level of 2-hydroxyglutarate changing, rather than necessarily uh, some other secondary effect. Uh, and so um, there have been these inhibitors that are developed, not by us, by others, um, and uh, it, it inhibits that uh, expression of 2-HG. So I'm going to, I'm just going to just illustrate really here that firstly, this is 2-hydroxyglutarate in the wild type. It, in the mutant, it's highly elevated. But then if we treat that mutant with the AG120 inhibitor, the levels come right down again. And then there's no real change if you treat the wild type, which is not perhaps important, but it's important to have this part of your experiment. When you look in detail, so obviously the fact that this is so highly elevated means it's difficult to see the, the subtle changes here. We can see that actually the inhibitor isn't 100% perfect. There's still a threefold change roughly uh, between the wild type and the mutant treated. And so we haven't got back to endogenous levels, but we have come down a long way. And if we go then jump into that lysine degradation pathway and have a quick look at what happens if we uh, include that inhibitor treatment, we can see that we've got this depletion, for example, for two amino adipate here that we, we're seeing. This is what's represented by the heat map. Uh, and then we actually see a significant, but not complete, re, um, uh, change back to a higher abundance when we treat with the AG120. Now it's nowhere near up here, so this may not be the total story, or it might be that this enzyme is very sensitive to the 2-HG level. So this we know is still three times the 2-HG level from the wild type but uh, even when, it, when treated with the inhibitor. But we are seeing a significant change. And in fact, we see a similar story for those other metabolites in this pathway that, was mo that were modulated. Okay, I'm going to, I think I'm going to leave it there. The, the last slide, um, or the slide slide is really just saying that one of the other types of experiment we can do is then follow up on those changes in abundance by using isotope traces. 
Uh, and this is a sort of separate field in some ways from metabolomics, but it's very much an important link. So um, this allows us to then trace the carbon atoms and the, uh, from substrates through the metabolic pathways, and in fact, work out the metabolic fluxes. So the rates of reaction through those pathways that we've already identified as being important. Uh, and we can do a very similar type of experiment, which we've done um, using 13C glucose and 30C glutamine, uh, and then um, some um, data analysis to enable us then to put together a, um, a um, flux map, as we would call it. So this is central carbon metallism. The, the thickness of these arrows represents actually the, the flux through that, um, through that part of the pathway. So the conversion of one metabolite to the other. That can be modeled, and this is a model based on those, um, the way in which those carbon atoms that were labeled look, um, were, were distributed through the metabolites that we can measure. And one of the things we found was uh, that the IDH mutant cells had a very different, particular arrows, very different in terms of the fluxes through them. Um, and we are still working on this. And this is very much preliminary data. This is not published. So I know this is going to become um, available but I would um, to, to, uh, to the general public, but uh, this is um, uh, to be continued work. Uh, and so this is our initial analysis and we want to, uh, we need to uh, confirm this through an additional set of experiments. But it shows us hopefully in general, uh, you can see how we can then start to really build up a picture on top of the pathways we've identified as changing, um, actually a bit more detail about what it is, at the rates of those reactions and which, which pathways, um, uh, which preferential routes through metabolism have been chosen by uh, those particular mutant cells. Okay, uh, and that hopefully has given you a sort of overview really of both an introduction of metabolomics, hopefully gives you an idea of how we go about those experiments, uh, how we can then in sort of put those together in the context of a particular type of uh, um, both discovery approach to understand the impact of a mutation, for example, in cells, but also then follow that up in the more targeted uh, view and also additional experiments to really understand the mechanisms of the, uh, the, the change that the, the, that mutation leads to a change in uh, at, the, at, the, at the metabolic level. Um, I've put a few papers here that come from our group recently. This one here captures a lot of the information that I've shown you about the IDH mutations, for example, and using iron chromatography uh, as a new methodology in that. Um, and, um, uh, and then I'll leave you with a slide just to acknowledge those uh, in my group who have um, done a lot of the work here that I've, I've talked about and have been absolutely fantastic in, in helping develop the new methodologies that we work on. And of course, to the funders who, who, who enable a lot of this work to take place. And to all of you, thank you. I hope it's been uh, an interesting insight into metabolomics. I'd be very happy to, to discuss, uh, discuss it further if you have questions. Thank you very much, James. Um, that was really a very comprehensive treatment of, of, of really an, a very interesting emerging field. Um, I think we have five minutes for questions. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question or if they would like to use the chat function, um, I'm very happy to ask a question on your behalf. I have a question, James. Sure. Um, here at the CMD, uh, there's a lot of interest in metabolic disease, and um, uh, and one of the, one of the issues with with um, faulty enzymes is when when an enzyme pathway is blocked, um, you can see metabolites building up. I'm wondering if you've done any any of that type of work at CRL. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, so I didn't mention it really explicitly, but but um, one of the things that in general we see. So if you have an inhibitor, I mean. Here, here's an example of an inhibitor that I talked about, but other inhibitors may be somewhere in a cent part, central part. Of it. So if there's an inhibitor, you know, usually things upstream of that inhibitor will often accumulate, but it does depend a bit on what alternative routes there are for that metabolite. So if it's just at a branching point, then you, you might not see that. But we've seen that with, um, for example, some, an uh, well, yeah, some work that was ongoing with, with anti-malarials, um, anti for example, linked to uh, nucleic acid metabolism, we could see that very clearly. You add the inhibitor, we saw a buildup of some purine metabolites, um, and then downstream often you'd get a reduction, right, because there's no there's no ongoing um, feeding into those pathways downstream as well. So yeah, we can see that. We've seen that in multiple occasions, yeah. So, yeah. you know, the theory works in that way. <laughs> we, we have this analysis that there's a bucket with a tap flowing into it and the hole with the, with the, with the metabolite flowing out, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it is, I think, quite sensitive to the branching points. That, and so it depends on where in metabolism you're really looking as to how easy it is to see that. And, and this yeah. does get to the heart of one of the, you know, the real challenges. You know, we're, all we're looking at is things going up and down. It's actually quite difficult to know what is happening then. 
um, mm -hmm. particularly if you've got multiple areas that are changing. So we have a question in the chat. Um, this is from Marsha. She says, what are the R or Python packages uh, libraries you use for pathway analysis? Yeah, good question. So I didn't talk about that, did I? So we use, I mean, there are quite a few packages out there and, and, and a number of them try to capture that whole kind of process of all the way from, um, uh, from taking that raw data through that process of put, putting together the, you know, um, making sure that you're, you're comparing like for like, getting all those peak areas together. There's, there's that data processing bit. And then the, the, the analysis, I think the statistical analysis, I think is what you were, your question was really focused on uh, as well. There's sometimes those go together. We use something called Metabo Analyst. Um, that's a free piece of online software, comes out of Canada. Uh, it's a fantastic resource. I have to say they really uh, develop it on a regular basis. Uh, and that allows you to essentially come in once you've got that raw data set into a data table, you can then take that and do statistical analysis. And then on the end of that, then there is pathways tools to both do quantitative pathways analysis. Uh, and you can choose organisms for that. So you can get a genetic, uh, a genetic pathways that are linked to the organism you're interested in as well. Um, um, I, I think you may have already answered partly this question, but there's a follow on question from Marsh. She says, she says, are there any packages, libraries you would recommend for meta metabolomics analysis? Yeah, sorry, I should say also that Metabo Analyst uh, uses R in the background. You get the R text out, uh, the R um, um, information out of it as well. So if you wanted to go and use, do that yourself, you don't need to use their package. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, other, there are other pathways tools if you're focused on pathways, of course, as well. Uh, I mean, IPA, Ingenuity Pathways Analysis, is one that's, um, there are licenses for. That's a kind of commercial uh, um, tool. Uh, uh, program as it were. There are licenses for that around the university, particularly in medical sciences, and it's a very comprehensive approach we, um, we've we used a little bit. Um, but we, we find some of those free um, softwares really, really good. Um, so we, we would we, we often stick with Metabo Analysts. Uh, there is XCMS online as well as an alternative. Um, so can I just ask if there are if there are no more questions? I think in the interest of time, it's now it's now ten past ten past two. So um, if I could ask everyone uh, to please unmute and just show your appreciation to James for for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you.